The New York City truckers boycott that began just hours ago are refusing to drive to New York City. Now, this originated from a, a reaction to a New York City judge's ruling imposing a substantial fine on former President Donald Trump and his family for what they're calling fraudulent uh, financial practices. And this is literally going viral and exploding right now. I mean, look at this. Trump endorses trucker campaign to stop deliveries to New York City in protest of fraud ruling. Uh, truckers for New York, truckers for Trump boycott driving to New York City after $355 million fraud ruling. I mean, it just keeps getting wilder. Look at this. It could shut down. It could shut New York City down. Female trucker joining boycott to protest Trump verdict says consumers will pay the price. So the legal action struck a chord among a segment of, tr of the trucking community, which perceived this particular ruling as an overreach, a, a miscarriage of justice, utilizing social media platforms like Twitter, not to mention TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, basically truckers and their supporters quickly got together and initiated a call to action. So a video posted by a trucker known as Chicago Ray uh, basically pretty much went viral overnight. Um, and it's pretty much encapsulated the whole vibe of the protest and the mobilization support across the nation. Folks, your old pal Chicago Ray. Uh, I've been on the radio talking, talking to drivers for about the last hour, hour 15 minutes. And uh, I'm talking to at least 10 drivers going the other way. I'm heading down from South Wisconsin. And uh, they're gonna start refusing loads in New York City starting on Monday. All right? Uh, I got about three drivers that I drive with. They already vibrated the boss and told them they ain't going to New York City. Now, this rapid assembly facilitated by, you know, just sharing a, a, a quick viral video on Twitter really highlights the power of social media to get things going. So in this video, Chicago Ray uh, discussed the plans, the planned protest against delivering goods to New York City, framing it as uh, as a response to what he and others saw as an unjust legal decision. Now, the video didn't just merely serve as a call to action. It basically became like a rallying point, a symbol for collective dissent against perceived government overreach. Now, this is so much bigger than New York. You guys have no idea. I'm going to explain exactly why this is in just a moment. All I ask is that you guys just take a second, drop a quick like for the video. I really appreciate that. And I thank you guys so much for always sharing these videos. It really does help get awareness out there and it helps out the channel a ton. So uh, you guys remember the take our border back trucker convoy, right? Culminated in Texas basically exemplifies truckers ongoing involvement and advocacy and and protest actions basically mirroring the spirit behind the recent trucker boycott here in new york city but both movements highlight how truckers and associated groups they're increasingly at the forefront of pushing for policy changes on national issues you guys remember the canadian um trucker boycott that took place in canada about two and a half, maybe even three years ago now, Justin Trudeau didn't like that one very much. Anyway, so there's still fallout from the Canadian uh, trucker convoy, um, even to this day. So advocacy and mobilization, like basically just as the New York City uh, trucker boycott aims to protest and instigate change uh, in a good way regarding governmental policies perceived as unjust, the Take Our Border Back convoy represented uh, a collective call for stricter immigration security. Uh, and both movements utilize the visibility and the mobility of truckers to highlight and advocate for issues that they believe are critical to national security and our, so our social well-being. So um, basically, if you look at the trucker convoy uh, in Texas, right, you have the, the Texas trucker convoy. Uh, it, it focused on immigration and border security, basically framing the border situation as a national security crisis, which it is. And it highlights issues like human trafficking, for example. And this parallels the New York City boycott underlying the narrative of addressing governmental overreach and protecting the interests of citizens on, you know, 
albeit different issues. Now, the journey from Virginia to Texas for the Take Our Border Back convoy, it was aiming to, you know, culminate large rallies and showcase strategic use of truckers' unique capabilities for long-haul mobilization in order to draw attention to their causes. Similarly, the trucker boycott in New York City, they're leveraging the critical economic role of truckers' deliveries um, to basically kind of put pressure on New York City and gain visibility for the protests. And so this is what's happening right now. The protest target New York City has been has has been chosen strategically as the epicenter of the of this legal decision and practically due to its heavy reliance on truck deliveries. Now, truckers across the country, they vow to refuse deliveries to the city. They're not going to they don't want to make their they're basically saying, no, we're we're boycotting this. We're not going to make any deliveries to New York City. Now, the, the reason is. It's aiming to disrupt the food supply very critically. And the choice of New York City really underscores the strategic use of economic pressure points in protest tactics. I mean, like aiming to maximize the visibility and the impact that they that they present. Now, the scale of the boycott potentially involving thousands of truckers emphasizes the collective power of coordinated action among uh, workers in essential industries. I mean, New York City's dependency on truck deliveries for like 90 percent of its essential goods, particularly uh, food, it places it it places New York City in a very precarious position. So this reliance on a single mode of transportation for critical supplies is a stark reminder of the vulnerability of urban supply chains. And of course, this protest, it really underscores the need for cities to kind of diversify their logistics strategies. But that's a whole nother situation, right? But get this, guys. So the case in question, it involves a New York judge ruling against Donald Trump, ordering him and his family to pay more than $350 million in penalties for fraudulently inflating his wealth for financial gain. Now, guys, uh, this fine, it was imposed after allegations that Trump and his organization misrepresented the value of their assets to secure loans and make advantageous deals. This ruling included specific restrictions on Trump and his sons, limiting their ability to operate within the state of New York City. This is a direct attack on, on Donald Trump, and it's it's almost blatantly obvious. And I think that this is, this is part of why there was such a great motivator, uh, a great source of motivation for truckers to want to kind of get out and get in front of this thing. Now, get this guy, supporters of Trump, even some critics of the ruling, they argue, keep in mind, supporters of Trump and critics, they're arguing that the legal action is a targeted attack against him. I'm talking about there are people who are not fans of Donald Trump that are actually saying, what are y'all doing? This is, this is egregious, largely because the practices that he was accused of such as inflating asset values, they're not uncommon in the real estate industry. In fact, they contend that these practices, while ethically questionable, are widespread and are often a part of negotiations between developers and financial in institutions. I mean, you even got people like like uh, Mr. Wonderful coming out and literally saying, who's not necessarily a fan of Trump, coming out and saying, hey, you're going to have to arrest everyone uh, or you're going to have to fine everyone who has basically ever used assets um, to get a loan because the way it works is whenever you're going to get a loan, you generally need to provide some form of collateral and you want to present your collateral in the best light possible. You want your, your collateral to look as valuable as possible so you can get the most loan. You've been doing real estate for decades. Does this case strike you as odd? Well, let's leave out Trump for a minute. And let's leave out politics and just talk about what happens in real estate development anywhere. So if you're a developer and you've got a building on a, on a block anywhere in America and it's worth, let's say, $500 million and you want to build a building right beside it, you go to the bank and say, this building is worth $500 million. I'd like to borrow a construction finance loan against this asset. And I want you to tell me it's worth 500 million too. And the bank negotiates with you and says, well, no, we think it's worth 400 million. And you fight it out. You're always trying to show your assets in the brightest light with the sunshine you can possibly determine for them. You want them to be worth the very most. 
because you're only going to get a 40 or 50 percent loan to value, as it's called. Then you borrow that money. In the case of a $500 million asset, maybe you get $250 million, and you build a new building with a construction finance loan. And so that's what this case is all about. What, and, and by the way, forget about Trump. Every single real estate developer everywhere on earth does this. They always talk about their asset being worth a lot, and the bank says no. And that's just the way it is. So in this case, when I'm trying to figure out, and I'm not pro or con, or I don't care about the politics, who lost money? Nobody. The bank got paid back the construction finance loan, and a new building was built. And if, if you're going to sue this case and win, you've got to sue every real estate developer everywhere. This is all they do. This is what they do all day long, every day. So I don't think this thing will ever survive appeal, regardless of what the fine is. This doesn't even make sense. Now, look, I know Trump's got a lot of problems in other indictments and everything else, but, but this, if you're a real estate developer, you're watching this, you're saying, what is this? Because let's just say you have a, a, a building, you know, and, and this is like, you know, uh, this is a Mr. Wonderful's example. You got a building that's like $500 million. You're only going to get half of that at best, maybe even only 40%. So you, you want this, you want your asset to be as valuable as possible because you're only going to be able to borrow a percentage against that. Anyway, so in real estate, it's very common for developers to present their assets in the most favorable light possible to get financing. The valuation of properties, it can be somewhat subjective. And this is why the banks and the financial institutions, they do their own due diligence. They do, they do, they do their own homework. So it's like, look, the bank signed off on it. They were good with it. The bank's not even complaining. They got paid in full. And so what's, what is, there's no harm. There's no foul. No one lost any money. No one complained. Developers and lenders, they negotiate these values with lenders, um, conducting their own due diligence to protect their own interests. So Anyway, banks and other financial institutions, they typically perform very extensive due diligence before issuing a loan, especially loans of half a, half a billion dollars. Anyway, so this process includes independent appraisals, market analysis, risk assessment. The argument is made that if Trump's asset valuations are indeed inflated, then they're part of a negotiation process with lenders who had the ability to verify those claims. So where's the issue? There is none. The focus on Trump's practices, according to critics of the ruling, highlights a very, it highlights a potential issue of selective prosecution, right? Hey, we're just going to prosecute this one guy. Why? Right? Where similar actions by others in the industry are just completely overlooked. And this selective focus raises a lot of questions about the motivations behind the legal action, suggesting that the legal action could be driven more by political animosity than a desire to enforce the law impartially. So, you know, adding to the perception of a targeted attack are public statements made by legal authorities involved in the case against Trump. Statements made during campaigns or in the media that explicitly mention taking legal action against Trump contribute to the narrative that legal challenges that he faces today are politically motivated. And of course, the broader controversy surrounding the, the ruling against Donald Trump touches on broader themes of fairness, the rule of law, and of course, the pol uh, politicization of, of illegal proceedings. It raises important questions about the consistency of, of legal standards and the potential that the legal system could theoretically and could possibly be currently, and we really know it is, be used as a tool for political ends, while at the same time ensuring accountability is essential, there, there is also a need for transparency and impartiality in legal proceedings to maintain public trust in the justice system. So this trucker's protest is literally just a symptom of broader social tensions, including disputes over fairness in the legal system the role that the government plays in regulating business practices, and of course, the power dynamics between different so, uh, social sectors. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the protest was sparked by a legal ruling against a highly polarizing figure 
such as Donald Trump, it only adds layers to um, to the social complexity of this particular movement. So the potential impact of the truckers boycott, it goes way beyond the immediate disruption of New York City's food supply. It raises questions about the effectiveness of these tactics in promoting change. Um, drop me some comments, guys. Let me know what you guys think about this. Uh, I think that we're going to see a lot more to come. I'm definitely going to keep you guys posted on the breaking news that comes out in, in the future. And I wouldn't be surprised if more comes out later today. So anyway, if you haven't already, do drop a like for the video. Subscribe to the channel. Share this video. We need to get this message out. I'll see you all in the next one.